imagine an Earth-like planet. It has oxygen-filled air, mild temperatures. It has continents spread all over the vast oceans. It has pulsating warm core, and it's beaming with life. In fact, there are many colonies which are spread throughout these continents on the planet. And each colony is unique, but they all collaborate. They exchange resources, food, skills, transport, information, even sometimes inhabitants. And there is a global government that is in charge of dealing with the planetary challenges. It has police, there is a kind of garbage removal center, there is an information and newspaper media outlet. Everything done globally, and it's an age of peaceful coexistence. And then something bad happens. A series of environmental catastrophes. Infrastructure is entirely damaged. There is no food, there is no exchange of information, and lots of inhabitants suffer. The whole continent is affected. Government is very slow to react. And in the small colony, at the edge of a continent, aggressive leaderships appear. They want food, they want resources, and they want more territories. And they are not taking them in the friendly way. The colony becomes stronger, the leadership becomes more aggressive. And the more strong it is, the stronger are the defense systems. Inhabitants soon spill out of the confines of the colony into the other parts of the continent. And the whole continent is taken hostage. The government realizes at this point, we can't react. Because the destruction of the colony would mean now the destruction of the whole continent. And then this would have grave consequences for the whole planet. This planet stands for human body. And this vast, expansive colony is cancer. And it's buried deeply in our digestive system, in pancreas. And it's built so well that all of the attempts to conquer it or destroy it have failed. So how do we deal with a colony that is so ag aggressive? And, and it has a, such a need for expansion. We can do it two ways. We can either destroy it completely, or we can destroy the aggressive leaders, we can weaken the colony, and we can allow the police and governmental forces to come in and restore the peace. And the first thing we are doing already we are flooding our body with a cocktail of toxic drugs in the hope that we will destroy aggressive cancer cells. But there is an issue with this approach, and this issue is that these drugs don't distinguish between the cancer cells and healthy cells. So ultimately, as the cancer cells are destroyed, so are the healthy cells too. And that has really grave side effects, as we know from chemotherapy. So the question is, can we actually make drug cocktails or therapies that will be more selective and therefore more efficient? And in Cambridge, we believe we can. And we believe we can design new therapeutic strategies to have drugs which are more effective, which have less toxic effects. And we are doing this with the help of nanotechnology. So what is nanotechnology? In short, it's a science of the small things. 
It's actually a field which is concerned with studying the properties and applications of structures which are smaller than 100 nanometers. And I can tell you this is very small. So let's, let's put this a little bit into perspective. Let's imagine that a pancreas is the size of New York. A 100 nanometer spheric nanoparticle would be the size of this ball. So now you imagine you are flying over New York and you are trying to throw this ball onto a particular building in Manhattan and you try to track it down. Yeah, you try to go into the Manhattan and then see where did you throw your ball. It will be impossible. But it will be a little bit more possible if you put a tracking device onto this ball. And you could probably track it down with your mobile. And this is exactly what the nanotechnology is also trying to do. We are trying to design nanomaterials that act as tracking devices. So they can show us where are the aggressive cancer cells. Once when we know that, we can design drug carriers that will take the drugs in their original form only where they have to go. And that means to the cancer cells and sparing the healthy cells in the process. And these carriers need to be big enough so that they can embed the drug within their interior, but they need to be small enough so that they can travel through the body, they can get through the pores of blood vessels, through the cancer tissue, and then through the membranes into the cancer cells. And this small size is actually one of the advantages of nanotechnology and its use in medicine. After all, our body, if you think of it, is made of cells. And these cells are made of nano-sized building blocks. So in order to study them, or influence them, we need to work with the tools which are nano-sized as well. The other advantage of nanotechnology are the properties of nanomaterials. So we can design nanocarriers that can heat up if you shine the light onto them, or you put them in external magnetic field. And as they heat up, they release the energy and open the coat so you can release the drug. It's almost like a remote control when you are opening your garage. You, you just press the button and there is an energy that opens the garage so your car can get out. But we can also design materials that fall apart when hit with a sound wave as well, which is quite interesting. And all of these advantages of these materials can be used to design nanocarriers, which will take the drug where it needs to go and it will release it on demand so that we can make the drugs more effective. And at this point, you might think that's all very nice, but what's the catch? Why don't we have many of these nanocarriers already? And you are right, there are certain challenges that we need to overcome. And one of the challenges is the type of material that we are going to use to make these nanocarriers. It has to be biocompatible. It has to be water soluble. It has to be soft, but robust. And in Cambridge, my group works with uh, materials which are inspired by nature, such as melanin from skin and we modify them with molecules that can help us track the cancer cells. And this is by far the biggest challenge of design of nanocarriers. How do you find molecules that are specific to the cancer cells, and how do you attach them to the nanocarriers? But there is another challenge, which is specific to pancreatic cancer. And this cancer is extremely well-built. It's dense. 
It has few cancer cells, but they are very well hidden. So in order for a nanocarrier to get through, it needs to be equipped with molecules that will soften the tissue and it, they will clear the path in front of the nanocarrier so that it can come to the cancer cells. So challenges are few, as you can see, and we can't overcome them all by ourselves. So design of nanocarriers requires a team of scientists. So we need chemists that will make molecules and they will assemble the materials. We need molecular biologists, we need cancer biologists that tell us a little bit about the weak spots of the cancer. And we talk to physicists and engineers because we need to know what kind of forces are acting within our body and how can we make our nanocarriers visible so that we can track them from the point of injection to the finish line. <laughs> you know what? We just sometimes need somebody to talk to. Because in the times of frustration, we need somebody to give us a fresh idea and, and to put us in the new direction, to listen to us. Um, somebody like my friend who actually drew this first sketch of aggressive colony. And this sketch was for me a tool that kind of turned the hazy idea of the story I would like to tell you into a real story. And in the lab, by working together, we actually provide tools for each other so that we can kind of push the boundaries a little bit further. And my group in Cambridge is a part of a bigger team. We work on three types of cancer, and yet uncurable cancers. And they are all different. So they differ in the shape, they differ in the organs they affect, they even differ in the types of the cancer cells. But they all have one thing in common, and this is that they are very, very aggressive. So 80% of patients diagnosed with pancreatic cancer will die within the first year of diagnosis. So we all joined forces to change that. But let's go from our Earth-like planet to our planet where we are living now our Earth, one and only. We are currently facing many challenges globally. And nanotechnology could help us to resolve some of them. Think about plastic waste and polluted oceans. Natural fibers, which are reinforced with nanomaterials, are explored as the alternatives to plastics. And to remove some of the toxic pollutants from water, we are already using membranes which are doped with nanomaterials as well. We heard earlier about carbon dioxide. Engineers have designed already artificial leaf, which is made of nano elements that can harvest carbon dioxide from air and turn it into the fuel and some useful chemicals with the help of solar energy. And if you are one of these people that like clean clothes but wouldn't like to waste water, then the self-cleaning materials might be something for you. And actually, the first astronauts that will land on Mars in the decade or two will probably wear spacesuits, which will be made of self-healing and self-cleaning materials made with the help of nanotechnology to save them from space dust or, or harsh Martian environment. And at this point, we might think that Mars is a suitable alternative to Earth, but I don't believe in this. I believe that we really need to work 
together to resolve some of the pressing challenges, and we need to do it now. And there are a few things that I have learned from nanotechnology and from design of nanocarriers that could maybe help us just a little bit in resolving those challenges. To come up with innovative solutions, we need to rethink our challenges. And then we will probably need to rethink them again and rethink them again. And to resolve them, we really need to work together. And good, sustainable solutions usually come in small packages. So I say, let's embrace the science of small things. Thank you. Thank you.